right, good afternoon everyone. We'll call to order the City of Murfreesboro Board of Zoning Appeals regular meeting for October 24th, 2018. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a consideration of the minutes uh, from our meeting on September 26th, 2018. Those minutes have been provided to the board members. Uh, are there any changes necessary to those minutes? No. If not, those will stand as approved. Uh, next, we'll move on to old business. Um, we've been presented with a consideration to rehear application Z18039 by Black Mountain Builders LLC for a five foot variance from the City of Murfreesboro zoning ordinance uh, requiring a 10 foot side setback for a new house constructed 5.9 feet from the side property line. And this is for property zoned single family residential RS12 uh, located at 2615 Ritz Lane. Chairman, yes. uh, as you recall, back in June, uh, there was an application for a variance on this matter. Uh, the board uh, heard testimony and held a public hearing. Uh, and at the end of that uh, hearing, there was a vote uh, to deny the variance, and that uh, was passed. So the, the variance was denied. Uh, the applicant has filed a suit, he's filed an appeal of that decision, uh, appealing it to the Chancery Court here in Rutherford County. Uh, the applicant, and that appeal is pending at this time, the applicant has also asked uh, the board to uh, reconsider the case. Uh, under the general rules, uh, a person who's denied a variance cannot ask for the same variance for a year uh, after the denial. But the board has the power to rehear the matter uh, if it chooses to do so. Uh, you're not obligated, uh, you're not required to have a rehearing on this matter. Uh, you, you can vote to do so. Uh, my understanding that if, uh, if you do vote to have a rehearing, that there will be a new application filed uh, I expect that to be filed in time for the November hearing, and this would appear on the November agenda, ass assuming that the application is filed and whatever our filing deadline is. Uh, there would be a new publication uh, and a new public hearing, and y'all would make uh, a decision after after that. Uh, and again, as I say, you're not required to grant a new, a second public hearing or a second. Uh, hearing, a uh, public hearing on this matter, but you do have the discretion to do so if you so choose. Frankly, I don't have an, enough recollection of all the facts from that meeting. It has been several months, uh, has transpired since that time. Uh, based on your statements and with this being a more or less a new hearing new public hearing and so forth uh, i would suggest that uh i would move to deny a new hearing on the matter however uh in my motion i would uh want to reconsider the motion that was made at the june 18th or the June uh, meeting uh, at that point in time at our November meeting to go back and review all the technical aspects of the our decision I, you have the authority to do that also uh, and as I I, I I failed to mention in my brief presentation that one of the bases for the appeal is a claim that the board did not make the specific written findings uh, that uh, the appeal alleges are required by the zoning ordinance. And uh, so you can look at the record again and, and then uh, make a new decision uh, uh, and, and whichever decision you would make uh, to, to support that decision by the appropriate specific written findings. 
uh, Mr. Chairman, that, I guess the point of information, I, my, I guess my reasoning behind that um, would be there's, I'm sure from the, the documentation, the information we were provided, research that was done by staff, uh, the questions at RASCA, the applicant at that time, were all uh, fully encompassing, and I, I don't see what, that, that there would be any kind of new information that a new hearing would bring about uh, that would merit having to go through public notice and uh, and go back through a, a, a new application. So that's that's really, I guess, the point of my motion, is at least we can go back and review. Uh, and, and for that review, we would provide you with a, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm sure you haven't reviewed it in the last few days, but we would provide you prior to the to that meeting a copy of, uh, of course, all the applicants, uh, the applicant submission, uh, the uh, the transcript of the testimony, the minutes that were approved, uh, any exhibits, documents, anything that was presented uh, during that hearing. You would have all that to look at again, and then to uh, base your base a decision on. Thank you. We have a motion to reconsider the application in the next meeting. Is that? A oh, second. Oh, so, uh, this, uh, so I understand we are making a motion to deny a hearing, but we'll review it at a later date. Is that? No. I know, am I putting that in very simple terms, or? As I understand, the motion is to de deny a new hearing, but to review the record of the first hearing and make a decision including the uh, appropriate specific written findings to support that decision. I mean, my only question would be is if, um, the, re if the request for the hearing is whether the applicant has got more information than, he, than, than what he would have given initially we wouldn't know that without having that public hearing. I mean, that's just a question. I, I guess that would always be a question, uh, and it would be up to you to consider uh, whether you felt that you had a full record uh, uh, before you. you the, the applicant had an opportunity to, to make his case before you uh, or not, and if you feel that there was something else that there's something else that should be presented, or it, or if you're just not satisfied that there was a complete hearing, then you're certainly it's within your authority, within your power to say we're going to have him submit another application and submit another hearing, and, and have another hearing. But and that could be our decision if we were to review past transcripts, application, and exhibits next month. Next month, our decision could be that we would prefer to have a new hearing? That would be a possibility if you looked at that record and say, gee, we don't have complete information here, then, then you, I, that we, would be a we decision. Aren't shooting, we, aren't, we aren't keeping ourselves from making that decision. No, you're not precluded from that. Okay, uh, I, I guess uh, and may, maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill here. It, I don't know that, are we giving him, or should we, or uh, we're basing our decision on that information that was given to us at that time, but we're not giving the applicant an opportunity if something has changed uh, with respects to the original hearing. And I don't know that that's the case one way or the other. I'd be the first right. one to say that if, if it's the same circumstances, I'm gonna vote against it. But if there are uh, if there's other information that we don't know about, and we're not going to hear that without having another hearing, that's my only hesitancy. And, and I understand that. And I guess as the motion is stated, the applicant would not be allowed to present any further. And, and I, I guess to me, it, it doesn't. It. it I, I'm hard to. Uh, recommend or reconcile that the the hearing would be that the data would be supplemented or could be supplemented it seems to me either you you make the decision based on what what you have what you had in front of you in june 
or you open it up and just and start over. Uh, and it, you may end up getting exactly the same thing, and you may not. I don't. I don't know what right. what will come in. Maybe I can help uh, clarify. Just to remind everyone, a variance is specific to the land itself, which is different than a use permit. A use permit there could be. Uh, things associated with traffic or noise or air pollution. Those are all things that could change, but um, because a variance is specific to the property, the property in itself doesn't change. It still has the same facts that were there before. So that may help in, yeah. in what you're thinking. Right. All right, so currently we have a motion and a second. Please. Yes, I'll second the forward. motion. Okay. Um, to, to reconsider, um, certainly there are merits for and against uh, both. This would be to reconsider based on the existing record. Based on the existing record, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But not have a Without hearing. a new hearing. That's, that's the motion. New public hearing. Yeah. At this time. Right, that's the motion that, that's, we're just reconsidering at this point. Any further discussion or we'll, we'll vote on that motion. All right, if not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed, no. All right, that motion is that motion is passed, so we will uh, we will hear that again next next month. Uh, the next item uh, under new business is a variance request. Uh, it's application Z one eight zero four nine by Harold Cry requesting a variance from the City of Murfreesboro zoning ordinance requiring a minimum front setback of thirty five feet to allow a front setback of fifteen feet. Uh, this is for property in an RS-10 zone located at 1820 Walking Drive. Ms. Rush, if you'd review that for us. Yes, the project planner um, is Austin, and he'll be presenting from the podium, which is kind of a new process okay. for us. So um, I will turn it over to Austin at this time. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and Board Members. As you mentioned previously, the applicant, Mr. Harold Cry, is requesting a 20-foot variance on the 35-foot required setback along walk and drive frontage of his property in order to construct a single family residence on a currently vacant lot. Being a corner lot with two required 35 foot front setbacks in a small cul-de-sac, the building footprint was, is very limited to begin with. The property also has a sinkhole that was repaired in 2015. A geotechnical report was provided to you uh, that would um, show that the, while the sinkhole was repaired, a 25-foot by 25-foot affected area would not be suitable for development, further limiting the buildable area. The lot plan provided by the applicant shows a building footprint similar to the uh, 1828 Walk-In Drive property. Uh, Mr. Cry is also here to answer any questions or have comments for, of his own. Hey everybody, good afternoon. You could ask questions, or I could just tell you the history of, of this poor little lot. Tell history. you what, like, that's fine. Okay. Fine. Uh, so the lot was recorded. My name is Jason Murphy, and I'm the project manager. I, I uh, put in these lots, if you will, for the applicant Harold Cry. We did about. I've done about 150 lots in the Huntington subdivision, which is out off of Dejarnet behind Pittard Elementary. If you know where I'm talking about, and uh, this lot, it's a cul-de-sac lot. It's got an eyebrow in the back. Um, which makes it a small building envelope to begin with, a 35-foot setback on two sides because it's a cul-de-sac. So the building envelope was small to begin with. Um, I don't know if in your exhibit you may see that there is also an AT&T easement in the back corner of the lot, which really makes the rear of the lot kind of hard to get at to begin with. Then several years ago, we had uh, the sinkhole, which was repaired, and... Uh, I have filled it, I can promise you, 50 phone calls and meetings from builders, realtors, and just regular individuals that would like to buy this lot and build a house on it. And by the time they investigate the size and the setbacks and the sinkhole, every single one of them have passed. And so, uh, because uh, when they go to an engineer or an architect, nobody can find a plan that fits over and over and over. And so uh, we've been mowing grass on this lot since 2006 and uh, picking up abandoned couches and piles of rock and stuff that people have been kind enough to leave us. And uh, so in speaking with the engineer, Bill Huddleston, uh, it was his advice to try to seek a variance um, so we could maybe try to scoot the house 
forward so a footprint could be found and uh, somebody could build a house. We've got an offer on the house. I've actually got three people on standby that say they would like to buy this lot and move forward if we could get the variance. And, and really for what it's worth, if I just don't know with this, with what we've, what we're left with on the building envelope and with the sinkhole and the easement, I just don't know if it ever could be sold. Uh, and somebody could build a house that meets the restrictions of the subdivision for the square footage. I think we're kind of stuck. So we would request, yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions for? Uh, one question. Yes, sir. The, you, you know, you've got a 35 foot setback. That's way it's established and you're asking for 20 feet variance uh is that due to the existence of the sinkhole why you couldn't say instead of 20 feet you could 10 feet or 15 feet or something less than 20. precisely yeah uh when the sinkhole was repaired there was the repair area but the geotechnical report which is probably best in the long run, but uh, they have said they recommend not building within, I think, either 15 or 25 feet of the repair area. And every time an interested buyer comes along, I have to disclose this report. And when they see that, it scoots them further out, and then they just can't find a plan that fits. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, yeah. I uh, see on the plat, there's a uh, the Bell South easement. Um, it looks like it's outside of the building envelopes. Am I reading that correctly? It is. While it's there, it's yeah. not really affecting where a house might go if the sinkhole was not there. You could probably be right. Okay. Uh, when, when this uh, lot was recorded in 2006, the market was still good. Lots were selling. But because this one being a small one, it was the last in the list, you know, to be considered. And uh, people did look at it and thought about ways to work around that AT&T easement you know, with the side low garage or whatever, but uh, it's, the sinkhole is the, is the real issue, I think. The at t easement is just added. It's always been there. It just makes it even that much harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, and the sinkhole came about long after the subdivision was Long after. Uh, the developed. sinkhole came in 2015, so nine years after the slot was recorded. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, so where this proposed building, on, or the proposed you have a space here that looks like you're, you're, uh, you don't actually have a building plan. It's just a proposal of a type of building that could be built there. Uh, yeah, where you see the hash marked area, mm -hmm. uh, the, the lot is under contract contingent upon this happening. And this is a plan that they submitted to me that said they would like to build. And so I submitted this plan to the engineer. Can you lay this plan on this lot to see how it fits, how we can make it work? And this is the end result. Yeah. So this is an actual foot foot envelope of the house as it would look on the yes, ma'am. Yeah. Property. And what they proposed to us. Yes. And and that is at the location where it is twenty. What, what did you say? Twenty feet from the the sinkhole is what the geotechnical report states. That the recommendation is to have it how many feet from? I think fifteen. Is it? It is okay. Fifteen. Fifteen, 15 feet. Yes. So 15. And that's. That, and that's how it's located. Yeah. And if you see, uh, you know, we've thought about it. And I mean, for your consideration, since we're talking is uh, if you I asked the engineer, uh, Bill, is, is there a way that we could instead of scooting the house closer to walking, could we scoot it closer to carapet and ask for a setback variance on carapet? And he reminded me, Jason, if you do that, you're still not going to get 15 feet away from the sinkhole. You have to go forward on this lot because of the shape. And it wouldn't work at an angle either, where it was not. Facing. I don't think. I, yeah. When when you see, the the plan that they're suggesting touches the setback in the back corner. I, I, it's we just don't have much to work with to begin with. In the AT and T easement, there's nothing that can be done there. It's actually a box, a big AT and T box on a pedestal. So it's it's there. Any further questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. At this time, we'll conduct a public hearing. Uh, if there's anyone present wishing to speak for or against this application, if you'd come forward, give us your name and address, and provide us any comments you may have. 
Seeing none, we'll declare the public hearing closed and open the floor for any further discussion or motion. I think he's got a lot going on here that warrants the, uh, the variance, so I'll make a motion that we approve. Subject to all staff comments. Yeah. Uh, can we? Uh, we do need to have specific um, statements for the reasons for the bindings. Um, and it, there is a handout that. I'll second the motion um, based on the fact that there are some obvious practical difficulties because of the shape, because of the lo also the difficulties because of the uh, sinkhole, the at t easement, and uh, as the uh, person stated, that none of those are uh, due to the, the applicant's uh, uh, causing, so. He's going to read it. I know. I think he worded it very well. <laughs> <laughs> you, you I was trying to help a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You adopt a second. Absolutely, <laughs> as he worded it. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve. Um, any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? There are none, so that application has been approved. Uh, next, we'll move to variance and special use permit requests. Application <coughs> Z18050 by Mr. Craig Parker of SEI Towers, LLC, requesting a special use permit in order to construct a telephone <laughs> transmission tower in a commercial highway zone. Uh, this is for property located at 1631 Northwest Broad Street. Uh, the applicant is also requesting a 75-foot variance of the 75-foot maximum permitted building height in a commercial highway zone in order to allow a 150-foot tall structure. Uh, if you would review that for us, Ms. Kerr. Thank you, Chairman, members of the board. The applicant, Craig Parker, with SCI Towers, LLC, representing Joe B. Beasley and Associates, LP, is requesting a special use permit to install a new wireless telecommunication tower facility in the rear of the property at 1613 North Northwest Broad and a variance to exceed the height requirement of 75 feet in the CH zoning district. The development is a monopole, an antenna with a total height of 150 feet, and ground-mounted equipment. In addition to the anchor tenant, Verizon Wireless, the proposed tower will allow for up to an additional three carriers to collate with their respective antennas, equipment, and reduce the need for additional structures in the area. The antenna support structure will be used for the telecommunications with the present state-of-the-art communication technology using PSC and cellular communication sources. The applicant's goal is to add capacity to the area with this facility to provide uninterrupted service for LG LTE users in the vicinity and new 5G service to be offered in the near future. Have an aerial site. A view of the site, um, you can see there is, it is a rectangular shaped lot. The current tenant in the commercial building is Avis Rent-A-Car and Budget Truck Rentals. The telecommunication facility will be located in the rear of the property. Behind the, the tower will be heavy vegetation and then of course the river behind that. The adjoining parcels are all developed with commercial uses. You want to show the photo of, this is a front view photo. If you look across the street, directly across from this photo, you'll see the front of the Avis rental facility. There is also a billboard on the adjacent property, and it will be behind the, the current budget rent -a truck uh, facility. Um, the zoning ordinance allows for the planning director to require a technical review by a third party expert at the, at the applicant's expense. The expert re, uh, review was required due to the complexity and methodology or analysis required to review an application for a wireless communication facility. And this required experience beyond what is 
possessed by the City of Murfreesboro staff. Mr. Larry Perry was hired as a third party expert to review the application submitted by SCI Towers Incorporated. Mr. Perry's credentials include degrees in law and engineering with extensive experience in towers and communications and related activities. Mr. Perry's qualifications are on file with the Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the State of Tennessee. Mr. Perry states he has no bias regarding the property, the applicant, nor any of the parties involved. His recommendations are contained within the report that is in your packet. The applicant has submitted documentation needed for a new telecommunications tower in this area. The submittal has been analyzed by Mr. Larry Perry, which confirms the accuracy and completeness of the submittal. The applicability and analysis techniques and methodology, the variety of conclusions reached and whether the proposed wireless communication facility complies with the applicable approval criteria set forth in the zoning ordinance. If the board wishes to approve the requested special use permit and the variance, staff recommends seven conditions of approval which are provided in your staff agenda. One that I do want to point out it is required that a structure have a fall zone equal to the height of the structure unless they can determine that through an engineer's report that it would be less than the 150 foot, which they did hire an engineer to do a structural uh, rendering showing that the fall zone would be 37 feet for the structure and that is depicted on their site plan. They have 37 feet, three inches for that fall zone in all directions. Um, the board will need to make separate motions for each request, a special use permit to allow installation of the wireless communication facility, and then a variance of, for 75 foot from the required 75 foot to allow the 150 foot tower um, communications tower. And then upon your decision, the board will need to make a written decision of finding either approved or denied. The applicant. Uh, is in attendance as well as the third party consultant, Mr. Larry Perry, to respond to any questions that you all may have about this tower. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Any questions for staff at this point? I do. Well, not staff, but maybe the applicant. Um, I'm not an engineer, but how do you have a 150 foot tower and only a 30 some odd foot fall zone? That was my question. Yeah. Engineering. <laughs> Mr. Larry Perry, the, the third party consultant. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, my name's Larry Perry. My office is at 11464 Saga Lane, Suite 400 in Knoxville, Big Orange Country, Tennessee. <laughs> um, we've been in this business for almost almost 48 years now, the towers, and uh, I was on the FCC's advisory committee for uh, three chairmen when we wrote the original rules for cellular communication. Uh, I'm going to answer your question here, then I'm going to give you a little bit of things you can expect downstream, what's about to happen to you in all cities all across the country and when they come up with the 5G. First thing is, the, uh, and I had some recommendations also to the staff, which they've included in your, in your report. Uh, one, may, one of the suggestion was that they, it's the only suggestion, you can't require it, but you can ask the uh, carrier or the applicant to wrap the antennas in this new 3M material because it makes it, it just, well, you can't see it, it's transparent, you see the sky through it, so it's really kind of neat. And it won't be quite as obstruct, as abusive as a lot of uh, people have it in the, in the past. Second thing is, uh, normally, when you put up a monopole antenna, and I've put up over probably 3,000 of them around the country, around the world, in 22 countries, I've never, knock on wood, never seen one fall over like that. They just don't do it. They're made to collapse about two thirds of the way up, and you had a the SCI had a consulting engineer to do the analysis uh, on this particular uh, uh, monopole tower. I don't like to call it tower; I call them support structures. <laughs> the, the, the public gets upset with towers, so we talk about support structures anyway. I went over his calculations. I agree with it. Um, however, here's what I would suggest that you also do: uh, if if you approve the their request. I also suggest that you have another letter from the professional engineer that wrote the original one certifying that the tower is built to his recommendation because that was one of the basis of his recommendations was if the tower meets the spe specifications that I've gone over, 
then they should do this range, and that's true. Uh, as a practical matter, the location not, is not a real major factor because you've got the river behind you, you've got woods on the, lot, the north, south, you've got a long driveway where a parking lot's right in front of it, so it's really not a major factor. But under your ordinance, it does require uh, falls under 150 feet, and they've asked for 37 feet, 3 inches, so keep that in the back of your mind. I, think, uh, I don't see any problem with that. Uh, the other one, the 75-foot uh, requirement, I mean, there's not, the building's not 75 feet, the tower is. 70, the tower's 150 feet requested, actually plus a little bit for the uh, lightning rod on top. Uh, and that's, that's pretty, this is pretty standard uh, all around Tennessee and you know, all your, most all your ordinances require the same type of thing. It's nothing unusual. Uh, they meet all the requirements, federally, state, local, with, the, with the exception of these two variances in your ordinance. And um, I, make, I, I suggest that you consider the recommendation of the staff, including the ones that I've included in there, uh, in your in your consideration. Now that being said, let me let me go if I can, Mr. Chairman, just a little bit further and tell you what's about to happen in, in, around the country when you go to 5G. You're in 4G right now, fourth generation. The new 5G uh, technology will be coming out at the end of next year, 2019-2020. And what this is, where this come, where you are going to be involved in in this, is you think you've got a, a bunch of towers now? Just wait. Now the new towers, for example, let me give you an example in Nashville and in Knoxville. In Nashville and in Knoxville, per square mile, there's going to be over 200 towers required. 200 per square mile. Now, the the don't get, before you get have a heart attack on me. They're only 35 foot towers. You can use telephone poles. Where the problem is going to be, and you're going to ha you'll see that here, out down around the university area here, and a couple of your subdivisions that are pretty uh, high, high residential. I mean, high density residential areas. You'll have it in those areas. The problem is the range is very short. It's only uh, four football fields long of their the new 5G. That's why you have to have so many antennas. Now the problem is going to be, it's not the towers or the or the the, the wooden uh, um, utility poles. It's the connection between the poles, between the two, the two, two antennas. It's got to be fiber optic between there. And if you're, and you got a lot of paved streets, a lot of uh, um, sidewalks, and if they're not already some conduit under there by the existing carriers, you got to tear all that up and put all the new conduit in. So keep that in the back of your mind as these applications come through. Your, your staff's pretty familiar with a lot of these things coming downstream, but I just want to give you guys a heads up because you're going to get inundated. But my recommendation is the staff can generally handle most of them because of the utility relationship with the uh, MTEIC uh, that, owns a, that owns a power pole. So I'll just give you a little heads up, so just be aware. Any questions I can answer? You had a question. You had a I got question. one. So is, is this tower going to be 5G capable? Yes, sir. Okay. All, of them, all towers are 5G capable. Okay. It's, it's the elevation what you want. Okay. Uh, the new 5G towers are going to be a lot lower. They're going to be down close to the bottom. This one will handle anything you want to put on it. Yeah, I just didn't want to approve something that was going to be outdated. With no, no, no. <laughs> well, if it's outdated, they have to remove it within 120 days according to your ordinance. So. Okay. And that's going to be part of the, the requirements. And if you look at your recommendations, that's one of the requirements that you get another letter from the, the carrier or from the applicant for, uh, that they'll remove it if it's not used for 120 days consecutively. Consecu mm -hmm. And that's pretty standard. That's, everybody does that. It's either 120, 180 days all around the southeast here. Uh, based on your comments, does that mean that the need for these uh, structures that are 150 feet tall is going to be irrelevant in the future? No. If everything's going to be 35 you're, feet? If you remember, when we first started out with this back in the early 80s, uh, we had 400 foot tall uh, structures and they kept coming down and down and down and down because what happens is your, your service area is smaller and smaller because it'll overlap into others if you don't. Mm. So the, the, the towers are getting shorter. For example, the 4G uh, technology right now gives you about maybe a little over three quarters of a mile coverage. 5G gives you four football fields, which is 400 yards at the most. And that's if you're real lucky because the frequencies and because of the elevation and everything. So no, you're not gonna have a lot more big towers like that. Is it gonna do away with the ones you got? No, it's not because you can put more carriers on them. Right now in the Murfreesboro area, in this Rutherford County area, you got five, car five major carriers. There's actually, in the United States, there's 12 major carriers, but you only have five in this area in Tennessee for the most part. Mm -hmm. And that's good, because that way we don't have everybody have their own tower all over the damn place. And it looks like what we're trying to, what we're trying to do with the, uh, the Tennessee um, uh, Planning Associates, I've been working with them for several years on this, 
is to not have a porcupine, you know, right side by side, where you got them seat 50 feet apart. Each one of them has, a, each applicant, each carrier has its, has to get the chance to use uh, the same tower. There's one carrier, and I'm not gonna mention the name of it, but they refuse to use anybody else's tower, and it creates a problem. Uh, that's, why I, that's why I encourage uh, cities, counties, municipalities all around the southeast here to have uh, these uh, uh, tower companies that are, they make their money on tower uh, usage, not on just on the telephone systems or the usage of the, of the telephone telecom system. So the more you can stack on there, the better off they're going to be, the better off you're going to be because you only have one or two uh, towers to speak to. And we've done a lot of work over in the, in the Rutherford County for their Board of Zoning Appeals in the last five years. And so we've been pretty well got this pretty well satisfied throughout the county here. So I'll just give you a heads up on it. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Craig Parker. I'm here on behalf of SCI Towers. Uh, I did want to address your question about how does a 150-foot tower uh, how does it break at a, at a how does it have a 37 foot break point? Uh, the tower is galvanized steel. Uh, when we order our towers, each tower is, is built to specifications. So we have a, a, a group of tower companies that we work with as vendors. They don't just set aside 150 foot poles or 160 foot poles. Each pole is manufactured per specifications. The break point is actually manufactured, it, it, it's 5% weaker than the rest of the structure at the break point. So that's how we design it. So if there were a structure failure, that's how we can design it to fail at, in this case, it would be at the 113 foot level. So the top 37 feet would collapse upon itself. So that's how that's done. Is that referenced in the plans that they've submitted? Yeah, uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. At this time, we'll conduct a public hearing. Is there anyone present wishing to speak for or against this application if you come forward? Seeing none, we'll declare the public hearing closed and open the floor for any further discussion or motion. And again, we have two components to this application. The first is the special use permit. I don't, I, I don't want to tax the staff on this, but have we recently, in the last 12, 24 months, approved similar applications like this? I can respond. Um, we have approved uh, two similar applications in late 2017, early 2018, um, within the city limits of Murfreesboro and sim similar height as well. Okay. Thank you. And I'm, no further uh, of you no, that you question. Go no, go ahead on. I was just going to make a motion. Uh, I'm assuming that the applicant has agreed to all these items that are outlined in the, uh, including this, the conditions, including this 3M conceal wrap, because if I've seen that before, I didn't know what I was looking at. Um, from my understanding, the, the two um, that were mentioned in the presentation from our consultant, uh, these were not included in the staff report, which was the 3M wrap and an uh, engineer letter certifying that the tower was built to the specifications. Those were the two items he said that were additional. 3M wrap is in its numbers five. It what appears. is in there? Okay. Um, yeah, we, we uh, what, what the um, third party consultant requested, we would like for those to be, we, they, we've incorporated them into the staff comments. Okay. They did submit a letter um, for the non-use of 120 days. It was what was recommended by the third party consultant. They had actually written their, their uh, letter for 180, so we would have them revise that to the 120. Um, but I believe we added, we did, number five is the use of the conceal wrap. I tried to consolidate his requests along with, um, along with the ones that staff had, had had as well. But I'm assuming they're in agreement to doing this. Well, as far as I, I, I have been told with all of this, that they would pretty much agree to whatever the staff recommends okay. that they do. Okay. Uh, 
SCI Towers, we are not the phone carrier, so we provide the infrastructure. The, uh, we happen to be a build-to-suit vendor for Verizon Wireless that will be the anchor tenant. Once the structure is built, they will be applying separately for their own application and building permit to put their equipment on our structure. So we do not actually install the antennas. Um, I do know historically we have had conditions where the antennas needed to either be painted or uh, there's, they're called socks that go over the antennas. Uh, I'm not familiar, I'm obviously familiar with 3M. I'm not familiar with the 3M, 3M technology. It's not that we wouldn't agree to do it. It's that we are not actually installing the antennas and I think it would be a condition for every carrier that puts their equipment on the structure, it would be a requirement of them. It's not, an, it's not that we wouldn't want to do it, but we're not the, we're not the wireless provider. We are only the, uh, the builder of, we build the structure and we manage the structure and then we rent the space to the wireless provider. So I think that would be a condition of every tenant on the structure that they need to do. So this 3M structure goes on the antennas or the pole? On the antennas that Verizon's going to, or the carrier would put on? Uh, uh, mine, okay, I'm very familiar with 3M, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it should be similar to what you would see like on a vehicle wrap, like a vinyl. Okay, so vehicles that vinyl is on it to put graphics on a, on a, or on a wall, something of that nature. There's not going to be graphics on the antenna, but it appears it's a self-adhesive material that is manufactured by 3M. Having that on the antenna it is no issue at all, but th we don't own the antennas. No. We own the structure. So um, if it needs to be a condition of approval, we can certainly uh, inform all of our tenants that they need to do it. But I would also reiterate uh, to the carriers when they apply for building permit to co-locate on the structure that that would be one of the conditions of their building permit. The, uh, the towers that have happened, I don't remember us seeing, say, that the company builds the tower when a carrier locates there. I don't know if that comes to us, does it? I can, um, I can explain since it comes through staff. So uh, when a carrier comes through to install their antenna or co-locate on an existing monopole, they do have to come through to obtain their building permits and also obtain planning approval. So through the planning approval, it's at a staff level we do make sure that what they're proposing is consistent with what the original use permit was approved for. So if the board would decide um, to add any conditions that would be required of the antenna, uh, those would be carried forward for any of the providers that would install on it. Okay. Even though they are not the applicant? Correct. Okay. So as my understanding, it would just be the condition of the approval, and so every subsequent tenant that goes on the structure, they would be informed, you need to use this, this 3M or, so I, I, should we reference it as 3M or just the, the type of technology in case there's other manufacturers of the, yeah. the wrap? My suggestion, it was a suggestion as, as opposed to a requirement. Uh, I just think it's going to be better for your people if you, if you, where you can wrap. It's like a, taking a piece of bread and wrapping it with saran wrap, same type thing. It just has no, it has no impact on the radiation of the, of the uh, signals and all. But rather than making it an absolute requirement, I would make it a, recommend, a suggestion, a higher recommendation on your part. That way, because I don't want to get into a position where the city is in a position to say, well, you're recommended a, 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 a special one company that does this sort of right. thing. Say, don't get yourself in that position. Yeah. Just say, this is what we would, re the, 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 your consultant suggested this strongly. And I think that solves the problem because 3M's almost got those right now. So I would just say it's a strong recommendation rather than a, uh, I'm a suggestion rather than the requirement. Thank you. May, may I also follow up? If the ordinance states uh, 120 days for vacancy, obviously we will comply with that. The letter we submitted said 180, but if the requirement's 120, we, we will okay. be happy to uh, uh, accommodate that number. Thank you. Uh, if no further questions, uh, I move to approve the special use permit with the conditions set by the staff. Second. Yeah. 
And Ms. Mosby, may I suggest that we modify that to say that condition number five, which as stated is the applicant shall use new 3M conceal wrap to, re to change number five to a suggestion as opposed to a condition okay. and that, that the applicant use a 3M type conceal wrap. There may be other manufacturers uh, with a comparable product. Uh, and again, I'm, as they said, I'm not sure we should require through, and 3M may be the only one that does it. That's fine. I don't know that. We shouldn't require it if there are competitors that are uh, of, of a comparable quality product. But you, you okay. can still we just simply take a conceal wrap and take strike any reference to a particular vendor? And that way you could make we it could a do requirement. That. We could do that. But it's not a requirement of this applicant because this applicant won't be installing the tower. But so the requirement then would be that the future uh, not tower, the future antenna installers uh, provide a, 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 a conceal wrap on their antennas. Okay, so moved on that condition. And again, second, without that objection. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I do. Are we making it a suggestion or a requirement? I think the motion is to make it a requirement okay. on the uh, antenna Okay. Installers. 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? There are none. So that the special use permit is passed. Next, we'll move to the 75 foot height variance. Uh, for the variance, I'm sorry. Going to say um, she's already presented on that information. I apologize for the pause. I mean, I if we're to use this template, I'm not sure where the practical difficulties are, other than how the thing works. Uh, and just as a follow-up, it appears more that technology uh, has kind of bypassed our our rules a little, uh, our regulations a little bit. I think uh, the gentleman made some excellent comments as to the whys of the uh, and the, and the actual impacts of these uh, types of uh, structures. And how you know that fall zone is 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 not you know and you know it's obviously a limiting factor based on what what they said. It's just that the fact is it is 150 feet high, and we would have to, I guess, to be in compliance, it could not exceed 75 feet, right? Correct. But we just got heard, heard testimony that once it goes to 5G, that you're going to see 35 foot towers. So. I, I'm not trying to, I'm just looking and. We will see 35 foot towers, but we will, the, the 150 or so towers will continue to be utilized. Mm -hmm. And there probably will still be even a few more, some places probably a lot more, there'll probably still be a few more of the so-called macro towers uh, as opposed to small cell uh, towers that will be in the 30 to 40 or so foot range. Uh, so the, uh, I, I guess a height variance is somewhat different from uh, the bulk regulations re pertaining to uh, uh, land usage, uh, but it, it is the, I, I think it's a, the, the technology requirement uh, that uh, for uh, adequate function, the, the height needs to be uh, at the level requested and uh, supported by the engineers and by and uh, uh, agreed to by our, our consultant. Uh, so what we're saying is we wouldn't, because it's a height variance, we wouldn't use this template in granting the motion. I, I, I think this template is not particularly appropriate for a height variance. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask the lack of a motion to approve this uh, variance and the fact that we voted to approve the special use 
this applicant could proceed on as long as it was a 75 foot uh, tower, correct? He could, yes. Okay, second. But it requires the variance for him to build the 150 foot tower 75. Uh, mm -hmm. at this site. Okay. The second question I have, again, goes back to these prior uh, towers that we have approved that we've already stated are at least 150 foot. Is, did those have a, a fall uh, factor that uh, that was was in compliance, or do y'all recall? Is it they did. Pretty much had some. Mm -hmm. They would have had fall zone requirements, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what the number was. And you know, if, if you're if you're in a hundred acre farm uh, in the middle of a pasture, you might not have a fall zone question. Uh, certainly, if you're anywhere close to a residential area, and and even this, although you do have uh, a parking lot and uh, a river bed and that sort of thing, there is still there's commercial and there's people's vehicles and whatever that are. Uh, in proximity to it, so the fall zone requirement is appropriate, and and uh, uh, I, we have we have required a fall zone uh, compliance in the past. And again, they have uh, very adequately stated uh, the impacts. Uh, I guess, if you will, west and south and somewhat north is all wooded area or riverfront and i suppose part of that's city-owned property anyways right uh, i'm not sure if that particular part is owned by the city or not but uh, uh, much of that area well, it's is the greenway i, mean, I don't know about that one yeah the, the greenway is i believe on the other side of the river so public property adjoining this uh, right is ours or not i'm not certain thank you I'll make a motion that we approve the height variance, uh, knowing that we don't have to use this template <laughs> for, for granting that uh, mo or granting the variance, subject to all uh, staff comments and requirements. I have, a, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that application has been approved. Um, next item on our agenda, staff reports and other business. I have nothing. Nothing. Nothing of lots of staff. Any? <laughs> <laughs> See no other business, we will adjourn. <laughs>